to us, hear our prayers. Lord, bless thy people, we pray. May we hear of the things of the Lord Jesus Christ, of his great glory and his wonders towards his people. And Lord, do bless us as we hear from the scriptures the things of God. May it be unto us as it is the word of God, the word of life. And may we glory in the Lord Amen. Jesus Christ and be built up in this most holy faith. In the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. We're turning to the book of Nehemiah. I keep calling him the prophet Nehemiah, but the book of Nehemiah, he was in many ways a great man and worthy of being a prophet, he was a true man of God and this is where we learn a lot from him we've, we've been really to the end of, of chapter 2 but now I want to consider this subject of the building of the wall and what is it all <coughs> about and so just to take us back to the beginning of the chapter chapter 1 in fact and we remember what had happened that the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province in Jerusalem in Judah are in great affliction and reproach the wall of Jerusalem also is broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire well the place was in a mess a total mess and this was Jerusalem was then the place, the one place where there was this great temple of God where the people of God who'd been called by God's grace, they weren't anything of anybody, they were the smallest nation chosen by God to be a people who lived to praise God, the living God, the true God that's made heaven and earth. That was their privilege and it's a privilege of us as Christians to be people who know and love the true God that's made us. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ and this is our, there's such a similarity between these two uh, situations. There are differences of course as well. We, we see some of those. Nehemiah meanwhile was living in a palace. Good for him. Would we like to be living in a palace? We're going on a holiday hopefully next week to a nice little island where it's going to be very nice but we don't want to live there we want to live here with all of you guys and folks and we want to be preaching the gospel and we want to be around London where there are people not just um, a sea and hills and beautiful things but where there are people who need to know and hear about the Lord Jesus Christ so we're not going to go and live on a little island and leave you just for a few days but Nehemiah lived in a palace. Can you imagine that? With something like the queen there. Well, he had the king of Persia there. And he was the king of the, what was the, really the empire of the whole, of the, of the world virtually. So this is where Nehemiah was. But then he hears about the worship of God. It's in a terrible state. The people are like um, tramps, as it were in their own, in what is meant to be the most glorious place where the living God is truly known and worshipped and it's in a real mess and people are looking at it and saying, well, what's that? And so this is the character of Nehemiah. And what does he do? Well, what could he do? What can we do about the church today? What can we do with it? Or what can we do with the, the terrible things that are going on? 
Well, Nehemiah was a man of prayer, and so he prayed. And we've been through that on several occasions before, how he had this great prayer. It's a wonderful prayer, and if you ever think to yourself, how should I pray? Read Nehemiah chapter 1 and read that prayer. He comes to God, as we've outlined before, believing in God, believing that is a God of all great and terrible, great power. We were praying, and God really hears. He's asking him to be attentive. He remembers his mercy and his love toward him. I can really come, and the God of heaven will really hear me, and I'll confess I'm a sinner. There's nothing else we've sinned. We're not coming to boast to God. We come as sinners. He comes with this. We've done very corruptly, but he says, remember the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses. Yes, take hold of the Bible. God's made it full of promises. And we come, however far we are, if we've gone to the uttermost part of heaven. If you come back and pray, God will draw you back to him. So he prays and he says, uh, he says for God's hand uh, to be upon them. And he says, that we pray as those who desire to fear thy name. That is one of the great characteristics of this prayer. We desire, we've sinned, we know we're sinners, but we want to come and pray for the God to do his the very best. He's done some wonderful things and he's promised some wonderful things. And we're come fearing to do what God says. So it's a really great prayer that Nehemiah makes. And this is what we should be like in such a state. But the point I want to make today <coughs> is that Nehemiah knew what it was that, that was needed and he knew what was wrong and it concerned him greatly. He knew that to have a wall broken down was a terrible thing. There's meant to be a wall. God fences, it was said of Job by Satan, he's, you've got to, you put a fence around him. That's why he's behaving, that's why he loves God. Job is all protected. Take down that fence and then see if he really loves you. And you remember the terrible trials that Job had. Well, sometimes God does that for us to some extent. He takes down the fence and uh, so he, he gives us a trial. But the, the, the fence and the wall is given by God. It's normally there. There's normally a wall of salvation around the people of God. So they're protected. So that they're, they, they're, they're separate from these sort of heathen that come and say, come and worship our God. Come and worship our God. We say, no, no. We're in, we're in this protected wall surrounded by the arms of God. And here we worship the true God. And the things of the world and the evils and the sins, they, they must keep that they're kept out by this wall that's there. But the wall was broken down. Uh, uh, if we went back into the book of Ezra, it, which we, we did look at earlier last year, for there, there, was, there had been this terrible rebellion by the people of God. They turned away from God, so he said, right, I'm smashing down your wall. It was promised in Deuteronomy chapter 28 that if the people sinned, God would take away their wall. The enemy will come in. So it's like that, isn't it? As a Christian, we sin against God and the enemy comes in. Well, you may say, the enemy's come in and tempted me. Whatever, we, we've been led away by our own lusts and one thing or another and the enemy's come in. And the wall is broken down. It says in, in Deuteronomy 28, there's a whole bunch of curses for disobedience. And it says, and uh, that there shall be this fierce countenance. There shall come a nation of a fierce countenance. And when they come in, they shall besiege thee in thy gates and thy high and fenced walls until thy high and fenced walls come down wherein thou trustest. So we're not meant to trust in the walls. We're meant to trust in God. Now the people of God are very blessed and some have a degree of security and we start trusting in the wrong things. It's not the walls themselves, but they trust, oh, we're safe. 
nice big wall around us. But when the people sin, God smashes it down and in comes an enemy to besiege thee. And they, they take them away. And the end of that chapter, it's just some very solemn words. It says, um, verse 66, And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shalt have none assurance of thy life. In the morning thou shalt say, Would God it were even, and at even thou shalt say, Would God it were morning. For the fear of thine heart, wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes, which thou shalt see. Uh, fearing and full of doubt. Our, our, our friend who's visiting us today has just been down at Canterbury and recording what's been going on with the bishops and the archbishops and of the Church of England. And they've taken down the wall. This wall that protects people of, of the Bible. They've smashed it up. And so there's no safety there. There's no pleasantness. There's just fear and doubt. So Nehemiah knew the importance of the wall to guard, to protect the people of God from every false teaching, every evil and every sin. Keep safe with God in the Lord Jesus Christ. It was interesting. In the time of Ezra, well, even before Ezra, the temple was was put back up that had been destroyed after this God amazingly turned a king and this shows you what God can do and we're praying for this today that God would turn the heart of the kings and the prime ministers and the presidents that, that they would say we've got to obey God he's created this heaven and this earth and this country that I've got charge over I must uh, honour him God can turn their hearts we our petitions and that they fall on deaf ears most of the time but there was this one called Cyrus and he, he, his heart was turning he said send the people back he may have had other motives but one of the things he did send these Jewish people that have been set out and their walls have been broken down and they've become captives and slaves send them back and let them build their temple and let them worship the real God again wonderful wasn't it he said that someone come along here build a big church I've got lots of people coming you're going to have this great yeah, fantastic and here they go and off they go and they, they get on with it and that happened but in that time they had the temple they had the place of God but they didn't build the wall back in fact in um, the um, enemies were, were, were after them and they knew about the wall and they got it stopped in chapter 4 and verse 12 the enemies come and they say, oh, they'll build this bad city and set up the walls thereof and be it known unto the king, if this city be builded and the walls set up again, then they will not pay toll, tribute and custom. So the work got stopped. So they were only able to build some of the temple, but they wouldn't let them build. They stopped the, the wall building because they knew the enemy knows, as it were, the enemies of God, when the Christian has got a wall around him and he's, he's as it were, immersed in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, then the enemy is kept out. When we've got the armour of God and we're full of the praise of God, there's a wall around us by God and the enemies are kept back. They're hindered. And it's the same with the city. Oh, they let them build their temple. Stop at the wall. So these heathen people can come in and out, tempting them, breaking their Sabbath day, uh, coming and bringing in their other gods, introducing them, as it were, to marry people that weren't believers. One of the greatest dangers that happens to people today. They, they're rather attractive, very nice and pleasant, not a believer. It's a disaster. It always is a disaster. There are exceptions by God's grace. He mercifully saves people sometimes in such situations, but generally it's a disaster because the other person leads their heart away like Solomon after many gods. So that when there's no wall, there's no protection. And yet, even in the time of Ezra, in chapter 9, he observed God's grace towards him. He said, uh, verse 9, chapter 9, verse 9 of Ezra, For we were bondmen, slaves 
Yet our God has not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia, to give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God, and to repair the desolations thereof, and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. Well, they hadn't actually built the wall, but they'd been so kept by God that it felt like they had a wall around them. And that is how the Christian should be in Jesus Christ. But the, 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 that was a vulnerable situation. The people needed a, 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 sure, a, a sure wall around them. And so when Nehemiah heard of the reproach of the people, because the wall of the city was down, he, he prayed, and in due time the king sent him back to build this, this uh, wall that had been uh, destroyed. You see, Jerusalem was always going to be a dangerous place. They, in the time of Samuel, when they went and conquered the land, they, they, they couldn't remove, they were meant to remove all the evil people out and just have the godly, can you imagine something like that? And just have the God-worshipping people there. But they couldn't remove the Jebusites. And then in, in Israel also there was people called Gibeonites. They, they, they came in by deception. And they pretended that they, just, that they were in trouble. And they got a place to stay there. They convinced people that they, were part, they could be part of the church, as it were. And so they stayed, they stayed there. And there would always be enemies attacking the church. But Nehemiah um, had this work then uh, put into his... You've got plenty of time, Emily. He had plenty of uh, time. So it was it was in uh, it was on uh, 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 Nehemiah's heart then that he should um, that he should carry on this this work. God had put it into his heart. Nehemiah chapter two and verse twelve. It says, "I rose in the night, and some few men with me. Neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at." Jerusalem and he acknowledges here that God then has set him up for this great work he, he has seen and he understands fully the danger of the city without a wall and God has, has put it into his heart to do this work now we may just say well that's a, a quaint a quaint expression uh, as it were for what I thought I would do but he acknowledges that it's God who's done it and all the way with with the work that he carries on he's seen the um, he's seen the the, the importance um, of, the, of, of the work there to start with and now I've still got something strange here with a piece of paper. I'm not sure quite what's happened. Um, ah, there we are. So he he has he has the um, so he he now has to do this great work. It's it's been put in his mind by God and into his heart that this is absolutely vital and in fact it was so vital at, at that time that that if if the city hadn't been kept this is the home of the people of God that worship God and it's the one from whom the Lord Jesus Christ was promised and Nehemiah knew and understood the scriptures and he knew that the that the work of God was the vital work and it needed to be done not just with a temple there but the city needed to protect it the, the church needed to have its boundaries and it needed to have to, to be able to keep the good in and to keep the evil out and of course we might say to ourselves well if God has a city and it's a holy place 
what's my part in it? I, I, would I even be worthy to be inside? It wouldn't I be one of those people that Nehemiah was trying to keep out of that city? But in, but in, in, in fact, by God's grace, there, there, there is a way in to the great holy place of God and we want to talk about that tonight is that the way there is a door in fact and I'm slightly muddling metaphors up here there is a door that is the Lord Jesus Christ and he is the way through a wall there's a see I've described a little bit of some of the evils that would destroy the work of God and there, there are many of them uh, today also and there are churches that are taken up with things that shouldn't be going on. And so the, the whole work is in danger. They may look like they're doing quite well and they're, they're quite successful, but actually they're in terrible danger. And some of them have already turned really away from the truth and others have nevertheless put them into great danger by not having this wall of separation between the holy and the world. Now, the Christian, of course, is in this strange position that we're living in the world. But, and that the, that the Lord Jesus Christ has, has really come through, come through the wall, he's broken down the wall, he's, he is the door. But it's, it's an orderly door. It's not the chaos that, that, that one would assume he's broken down a wall, but he's broken down a wall that separated people by sin. But then he himself has become the door to go through the wall. He, he hasn't just broken it down and just left chaos around. There is order with God in Jesus Christ. And he is a narrow way to life. But at the same time, the people of God must uphold a church that is separate from the world. It isn't jumbled up with other religions there's this only there's this one true worship of God and that is what Nehemiah had and he had it right you see there are today they say well don't feel that that, that wall it's so off-putting it's so ugly that you have uh, rules you have commandments that you have God says this is right and that's wrong no just let's all come together don't have a wall at all but effectively what that says is that the holiness of God doesn't matter, the true God doesn't matter, and the enemies of God, well, they're, um, they're all just friends. But the thing is that, that there's a muddling and a confusion. The Christian is to love their enemies, that they'll come through the door and come into the holy place of God. We are not to be breaking down a wall and pretending that it's not there. There is a sharp division. Jesus Christ is very plain. There's a, a sharp division between the sheep, which are his people, and the goats who are on the road to hell. And we must be very clear about it. And the, the church must be kept pure and holy. Well, that is including us. You say, there's enough sin inside me to make a church unholy. So we are to be like Nehemiah and to confess our sins and to come to God as he, as he did. And then there's the, the other thing that you'll find happens in it. Well, there'll be lots of difficulties Nehemiah has. As soon as he starts on this project, people hate it. They want to get rid of it. They want to stop it again. And then they want to join in. They say, well, we'll come and help you. We'll come and help you build this wall. And this is what the Roman church does. It comes and says, well, come and join together with us. It'll be so much better. We can build a bigger wall and a better wall. But the fact is that it's no wall at all. It's a fake wall. It's a false wall. And it's not doing any good. Because we need a spiritual wall, which is the salvation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is a, a clear dividing line between heaven and hell. And the, you, you can't create a church that's made up of fake walls. It's of no use. In fact, it's dangerous because people won't know what side of the wall that they're on at all. Well, our task then is somewhat similar to Nehemiah. We need to know 
that there's this big division and it must be kept and we're not to be ashamed of it we're not to be ashamed to say well we, we can't muddle up Christianity and and all the other beliefs that are going on they're quite distinct there are blessed blessings from Christianity that others have picked up on but it, we've got to be very very careful that we don't water down the truth the plain truth of the matter is that the man is full of sin all of us we're all the same and that Jesus Christ is the only saviour why did Jesus Christ come and die on the cross some people just think well it was just very moving and he came he said he, he, he died for sinners he came to save sinners he came to save people from their sins and if they don't confess their sins and come to God then they're not part of Christ they're outside the wall there's as it were an invisible wall we could have they're not in they're not part of the kingdom of God there's some beautiful promises in the scriptures you, you may think well this is a hard job what, what am I going to do I say we've got to be relying on the Lord Jesus Christ he is the one and only saviour and as Nehemiah did when he saw the state of desolation well did he despair did he give up no he turned to pray he turned to the Lord and there, there are some beautiful promises in the scriptures in Isaiah chapter 61 Isaiah chapter 61 says the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek the verses that Jesus read he has sent me to bind up the broken hearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion to give unto them beauty for ashes the oil of joy for mourning the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that they might be called trees of righteousness the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified and they shall build the old waste places and they shall raise up the former desolations and they shall repair the waste cities the desolations of many generations it's what we've got in our land today the desolation it's not just one generation that's turned away from God we've got the desolations of many generations but the promises here is they shall build them up when the spirit of the Lord is upon them Amen. God in Zechariah the prophet Zechariah and chapter 2 and verse 4 and 5 we have you can be inspired by the beautiful words of the Bible not just because they're beautiful words which they are it does help doesn't it that the Bible has beautiful phrases in it but that these are the words that are in which God is putting forth his promises so listen to this, Zechariah chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. If you need some help and some encouragement, not to be afraid of the enemies, the, the smashing down walls, but you will get inside the wall, which is the, the faith in Jesus Christ, and rest in him, and be content, whatever the world is hurling at us. As we get on with indeed it seems a work of building again the church of God it says they said unto him run speak to this young man saying Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein it's so big it'll be as if there's no walls for I saith the Lord this is the promise from God 
I, for I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about, and will be the glory in the midst of her. That's the promise. If our only hope is that Jesus Christ died for my sins, he's coming again to bring us to himself, and we, we acknowledge that sin is to be departed from, depart from evil, then the Lord will be unto her a wall. The Lord said to Abraham, I am thy shield and thy very great reward. The Lord himself is the satisfaction of his people. He is the fire round about them. Have you ever had a sense of feeling in danger? Well, here's a sense of being safe trusting in God and the Lord himself is a wall of fire around you to keep you and protect you and will be the glory in the midst of her. So you say, well, it's rather lonely. I'm surrounded by a fire, a fire of God. But what about inside? Well, inside, if we're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, then there is the glory. God is the glory in the midst of her. If you've got nothing, if you've got very little, if you've got the glory of God in the midst of you, then you're doing what Nehemiah was doing. And you're, you're, you're focusing on the work of God. This is the one thing that will endure into eternity. The work of God. The endurance of the church of God is that he will bring his bride to himself. This is a glorious work. It's a good, it's the best, it's the greatest. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls. That's why Nehemiah was doing what he was doing. That's why he just didn't say, oh, sorry, and stayed quietly in his palace. He was concerned for the glory of God. And the glory of God is, is in the church of Jesus Christ where God's glory is in the midst of us and the walls of fire of the Lord surround us. So I want you to be encouraged and to be emboldened and not to cave in to those that are seeking to scramble up the wall and to get into the church who've got no doings in it or those who are um, claiming to be churches but they don't discriminate between right and wrong and true and false and it's all jumbo it's such a mess we may have a small little church but I trust that we'll say that our only strength is the strength of God mm. and sometimes it's good to be weak because you know where your strength is so we don't start feeling we're doing this and we're doing that but we do we do know that that, though the, 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 that there is a wall that's broken down by Christ, yet there is still a wall of fire of the Lord around his people. And we have our friends in various places that all have this sense. A, a few in Dublin, a few friends in America here and there, friends in, in uh, Burma and Italy and Greece. and all, well, There's all the Christians we know personally, I know you probably do as well, in all sorts of places, in all sorts of situations. And we're together um, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're committed together to the furtherance of the gospel. To not be afraid of man. Not be afraid of kings. To say to the king, look, this is the work we've got to do. And this is how we've got to put it today. We're not going to be, as it were, faffing around, trying to persuade uh, people on one or two things. The great thing is the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in him that we rely and we depend. And this is the essential work, the gospel of Jesus Christ. People need to know they must turn to Christ if they're to be saved. It's most, most urgent. And we are to be involved in carrying on with keeping that this is the important matter, the very, very important matter. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we beseech thee, Lord, to be merciful to us. We see that it seems to us as if the, the wall of the church has been broken down and there's so much 
uh, confusion and compromise and worrying about all sorts of issues that thou hast in, in thy hands the, uh, the, the feeding of, of the poor, the care for the environment, Lord. But thou hast set the gospel as the central feature and the Lord Jesus Christ as the point of worship. And we pray, Lord, that thy people may be strong in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou would build and help us to be part of this building of the true temple of the people of God. Lord, be merciful to us. Lift up our hearts unto thee, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's sing a little bit from Psalm 88, Psalm 88, page 191. We'll just sing, we'll sing to verse 9. It's a, a prayer in troubles, calling upon the Lord. Psalm 88. We'll stand together. Just down, down to verse 9. Lord God, my Saviour, day and night, before the cry have I. to us thy people Lord keep thy church we pray we thank thee for the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ that the gates of hell shall not prevail but the Lord Jesus Christ will build his church Lord cause us to repent of every sin and to live to thy glory and may the blessing of God the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost be with you all evermore. Amen. And thank you, O oh Lord. Thank you, O oh Lord, for giving us this opportunity to come to church and giving us this church so we can pray and listen to you, listen to you, O oh Lord. Please hear my prayers and please let me hear, please let me see Bill again. I like him a lot and I've got feelings for him. Please let that be so. Please let him say yes, that can see it again. 
Turn you around, George, so you can see everybody. You can turn around. Let me see. George, I want an apology from Don't you. Don't you pushing in for people around. What's going on? I want an apology from you. Gently, 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 gently. You bash it into people. You can't hear, you can't hear, can he? I want an apology from you. It's dead, shout at him now. He's nice. got death. I know, he can't hear, oh, he can't hear. Can't hear. You're a bit fast on your scooter. Huh? Not when you called me on Friday. Not when you called me on Friday. You you have to sort it out quietly. Well, I'm going to make a complaint about him. Why? I think it's a speech with staff. What's he done? Bashed into you? No, he bashed into people, yeah. Do you want to call me on Friday? You just have to keep out of each other's way. I was coming up there and he was coming. No, I don't want to hear it. Here comes a fat coward then. Uh, he probably didn't really mean it. Did you didn't mean it, George? I think he probably didn't really mean it. Too bad, George. Thank you, George. I think that's all right. Sorry. I want an apology from him. He knows he's... <laughs> we can all be a bit... We, I think sometimes we say things that we wish we didn't say. He bashes into people, I know that. We can't be I've sorry, can't we? Other people yeah, have seen it. it. That's why Jesus died for our sins, because we sometimes chairs, we can't... We can't do much, can we, really? Them. When you get older, you say things. That you, it's hard enough when you're young, but it can, it can come to you when you're older. I knew somebody who was a very nice man, and he started saying strange things when he got older. Uh-huh. All these rooms are going to be done out soon, and the laundry room. What? Laundry room? Did you yeah. find it? The laundry room is going to be done for right. on Tuesday. Oh, yeah. It's going to be well, shattered. Well, well, yeah, but 12 o'clock, no, yeah. From 12 o'clock to 12 o'clock at night. Yeah, yeah. They're all the machines are going to be cleaned, okay. altered. Yeah. It would be okay. Oh, they might be replacing yeah. somebody, isn't it? No, one's, one's got to be mended. Uh, right. if, uh, if we eat by about one, you'll be by about two, because we'll get there by about three. Uh, I'll finish your little bit, but I have a ticket. If I can get my ticket. Oh, I'll print that when we get back. Yeah, okay. yeah, be all right. Have you got a ticket to get back tonight? Oh, I've got a ticket. I need a boarding pass, though. I've got to lose we can print that, yeah. yeah. We can. Yeah. Yeah. Grace, will you sign the book with me? Yeah. Um, so we're going to get yeah. going. Yeah, 6.30. Um, David! Are your phones still here, Peter? Huh? Okay. Oh, yeah. okay. David! Yeah. Will you all come back and see us? I hope so, yes.